once a person finds out that you're a criminal defense lawyer, inevitably they ask, how can you represent those people? They don't mean, how can you represent a young person who shoplifts a pack of gum from CVS? They don't mean your cousin who had one glass too many at some event and gets pulled over for drunk driving. They mean guilty people who do bad things. But for me, the truth is, I like guilty people. I prefer people who are flawed and do bad things to people who are irreproachable and do the right thing. Guilty people are more interesting. The reason I wrote Guilty People is because most people find it pretty easy to understand why lawyers represent innocent people. They have a much harder time understanding why lawyers represent the not so innocent. And this book is about the humanity of the clients criminal defense lawyers represent and about the absurdity of the system they find themselves in. I've been representing poor people accused or convicted of crime for more than 30 years, and it's kind of my life's work. I'm a really happy defender. I feel lucky to be a defender. And the shortest answer is good people sometimes do bad things. People make mistakes. People make mistakes for all kinds of reasons. And that's a very strong motivator for me. Once I'm appointed to represent a client and I'm standing beside that human being, I'm acutely aware of my client's humanity and that they don't need one more person kicking them when they're down. They need somebody standing beside them as their advocate. And it feels like a privilege to play that role. Of course, there are all kinds of overarching reasons for representing poor people accused or convicted of crime, including the fact that we live in a time of mass incarceration. And that may sound rhetorical. It's not. We stand alone as a Western democratic country in the number of people in our country that we put in cages. Um, it's extraordinary and depressing. And I think we're going to look back on this period of history with shame that we are spending all the resources we are human resources, as well as financial resources, to take people from their families and their communities. There's a disproportionate impact on black and brown people, on people who could be brothers and sons and husbands, but who are serving just excessively long sentences. Nonviolent drug offenders are not the reason we have mass incarceration. It's because we lock up people for crimes like burglary, robbery, murder, and yes, even crimes of sexual violence for much longer than we need to. We reach a point where there are diminishing returns. One of the things we've learned in the 21st century is there are some crimes that are high recidivism crimes and other crimes that don't lead to reoffending, that are one-off offenses. And paradoxically, murder is the prime example of that kind of an offense. People commit that offense due to context, circumstances. Um, and in a country that's obsessed with firearms, um, murder happens with much greater frequency than it should because when you're firing a semi-automatic weapon and you're spraying bullets, somebody's bound to be killed, I often say about my clients that the difference between somebody convicted of assault and somebody convicted of murder, in other words, the difference between somebody serving a sentence um, that they can serve and get out and still be a young person and somebody who's likely to die in prison is often luck and inches. Increasingly, I think young people are drawn to criminal defense work for, for these reasons. There's the kind of conventional lawyering reason, which has to do with the role of the criminal defense lawyer in the adversary system. But the greater draw for my students, for young people and young lawyers, I think is the harshness of punishment um, and the phenomenon in this country of over-criminalization. 
where we lock up way too many people for too long and we tend to regard every social problem as a criminal justice system problem so that we lock up poor people, homeless people, people with mental health problems, people with substance abuse problems. And the other reason that seems to draw, especially young people, is the inherent racism of our criminal legal system. It's very hard to separate out race from criminal law enforcement in this country, and that's been so for generations. Um, what's interesting to me is more and more young people come to law school having read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow as undergraduates um, or similar books. And they come with an intellectual consciousness. And then they've also grown up during a time when more and more cases often captured on iPhone video of young black men being killed by police officers, generally unarmed young black people, um, has also created an awakening, I think, in young people about the importance of getting involved in the criminal legal system and, and trying to make a difference. Look, I'm a teacher, and I, I like to think if I could expose a law student or a young lawyer to criminal defense, in particular on behalf of poor people, um, that they would get what's so meaningful about it. But I also recognize it's not for everyone. It takes what Professor Barbara Babcock has called a certain heart set, mind set, and soul set to represent people accused of crime. And for whatever reason, I seem to have that. And every year, I encounter students who take the clinic I direct and students in the fellowship who feel the same way. With regard to the folks I represent, and especially um, when the people I represent have been convicted of, of heinous crime, serious crime, the kind of crime that makes people ask that cocktail party question, how can you represent those people? Lately, I've liked quoting a man who served decades in prison and recently re-entered society, and he was testifying at the resentencing hearing for a friend of his who he had spent time with who was convicted of armed rape 32 years ago. Now, this man who is still incarcerated for that crime, and that's a kind of classic crime that prompts the so-called cocktail party question, that man is actually an extraordinary human being. He's humble, generous, kind, self-educated. He's the kind of person that other people look up to and whose respect other people want to earn. He has completely transformed himself in prison. He was a very young man when he went in. He's middle-aged now. And so the, the guy who I, I like to quote was testifying at, at his friend's resentencing hearing. And the prosecutor kept cross-examining about him about how serious the crime was. And finally, he stopped paused and looked up at the judge and he said, Your Honor, the crime doesn't change. The person changes. That slays me because it, it says it. It says it better than I could ever say it. Sometimes our clients are, are more eloquent than their lawyers.